communications coordinator with the anti-domestic violence group uh, in the city, Sucky for South Asian Women. Um, and I was previously a reporter um, at a couple of small Queens Weekly, so I sort of have a little bit of background in terms of uh, doing PR type work and also uh, journalism. So my question um, for the journalists on the panel is how, I mean, I get requests from student journalists and also um, mainstream press for a whole host of issues, but how do you maintain a relationship with a journalist in the sense that you want to offer information about policy and the context and all that stuff, but as a reporter I know what people really want to read is the hook, you know, the drama, the, the specific, you know, violence that happened. How do you engage a reporter without making the reporter feel like you have, you know, this conspiratorial agenda to push your, you know, ideological view when, I mean, from our perspective, we're just trying to provide a context to, to make sure that the, the survivor isn't um, exoticized or, or, or just made to feel like just a helpless victim. So you want you want a way to get the policy story out, right? No, for instance, I got a call from an old friend at a paper, and um, there was a Sikh couple, uh, and, and uh, I, I believe what happened. I think it was in Queens a couple weeks ago. The man uh, slashed his wife and his kid. And, you know, he called me up like this. Uh, you know, and and I didn't want to I didn't want to offer a comment just based on this one specific violent incident. I wanted to be able to somehow cultivate interest in the policy stuff. I would offer the comment and then I would go back and cultivate the interest. I was gonna say, if, you don't, if you're not there when someone needs your comment, then they're not gonna think of you later. But if, if you're doing things like panels and stuff, obviously it's really hard to get reporters to be interested in reporting on those, but a lot of times I'll go to those things and come out of them with a story so the issue is, is there. But also, I mean, if, if you tell me the day before, it's pretty likely I'm not gonna show up. If a couple weeks in advance you, we, we talk about the issue, and then find something in that that could be a story that's gonna go a lot further than the eight inches that's gonna go inside of, next to the obituaries about your panel. Never underestimate how much reporters love a story wrapped up on a little silver plug. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you have, uh, if you have an anecdote uh, and you also, that tells that little story about, that tells a story about the interpreter problem, and then you have some facts that you have dug up from somewhere or a little survey that you guys have done or something that you found, I mean, that's a great little story. I, I should also say that at the Dart Center, one of the things we found is that it's actually possible to put journalists and advocates together in non-threatening environments in which they can educate one another about their needs. And in fact, the Dart Society, which represents the winners of Dart Awards and, and fellowships represented by Deirdre over there, has an par ongoing partnership with the Pointer Institute to provide programs on sexual assault and sexual abuse, I've recently completed one. That is just that, that brings victim advocates and brings journalists together in an educational setting to talk about issues of common concern. And people get story ideas coming out of that. And um, clinicians and advocates themselves need to be educated about working with journalists. So the Dart Center for any clinicians in the room has a wonderful pamphlet called Child Clinicians and the Media, which kind of takes the other side, which says what do you know, what are the clinicians who want to worry about their their folks interacting with journalists, their clients, or about issues need to know. Um, it's a complicated equation.